Okay, so now we're entering our last uh, type of um, research study. And this is the relational studies. Um, and we're going to talk later on in the lecture about the different types of studies and uh, some of the nomenclature and terminology. But first, I kind of want to give you a preview and give you a little context where this came from. Uh, I was driving home one day and I listened, listened to NPR, and they mentioned uh, this compression clothing article, which you can see right here. And it was a really quick snippet, maybe 30 seconds. And it said that this researcher found that compression clothing, not the magic bullet for performance. And I don't know about you, but you know, I drive home or I'm uh, you know, in the park uh, going for a jog and I see people wearing their compression stockings on their calves, they're wearing sleeves, they got water bottles, they got all this gear and stuff on. And I've always wondered where, why are they wearing all this kind of stuff? What's the benefit to it? And especially when you when you consider this stuff costs a lot of money if you get I guess the top stuff um, I mean we're talking forty five dollars for a pair of socks and I mean my socks last me you know however long they last me then I destroy them so I can't justify myself paying forty five dollars but I'm not an elite athlete so maybe it does have some sort of physiological or or a benefit to it. But as you can see, the NPR uh, snippet said, well, no, it doesn't. So right when I got to office, I, I went to NPR and I actually uh, went to this link and it, it linked to the research article, which I thought was great. The problem was this. So I, I went and I tried to pull up the research article. And um, so here's the research article. And the problem is it only linked it to this abstract. And I went to the um, international Journal of Sport Physiology, Physiology and Performance. Unfortunately, UNCG doesn't have a subscription to it. And we went to the publisher themselves. It would have cost me $25 just to get this one article. So we're going to have to deal with the abstract, but you, you can still get at least the idea of what the article is about. And, and the key part is right here at the bottom of the abstract. There were no differences in VO2 or kinematic variables between the control group and the compression stocking trials at any speed. So what this study basically showed or suggested was that compression stockings don't give you the performance uh, that you that they are touted as giving. Well, that's only one study, um, and as we know from prior units, uh, it's always good to try to find more than one study if you're really going to make an evidence-based clinical decision. Well, the best way to get a collection of studies is doing what? Right, a systematic review or a meta-analysis. Those are at the top of our research paradigm and our research uh, pyramid. So let's try to find a systematic review or meta-analysis. That's what I did. So I ran a quick search for it. And I came up with, I hope this is the right one, there it is, compression stockings and aerobic exercise, a meta-analysis. Perfect. Let's get all the sources together. We'll go through them. And this will give us a good starting point. Not so fast. We already know what tool we want to use when we do a meta-analysis or a systematic review. We want to use the Prisma. It has a lot of good guidelines. It's not an assessment tool, but at least lets us know how we put together our systematic reviews and our meta-analysis and make sure that the content is at least there. Well, here's the problem. So I'm reading their abstract here, and you can read with me. The aim of this study was to conduct a meta-analysis, blah, blah, blah. And they said studies were found by using search engines Google and Galileo. Now, if you're going back from our prior units, how many databases are out there that's related to kinesiology and this type of thing? There's dozens of them out there, and they use Google and Galileo when they could have used a ton of different search engines. So automatically, in my mind, that's a red flag or at least a yellow flag that maybe this meta-analysis does not have the, the content that I need it to have. But we can scroll through, we can read more about it, etc. They go through inclusion, exclusion criteria. And if for nothing else, we should remember from our prior unit that there should be some sort of flow chart, that they should talk about how many articles they found, exclusion criteria, and how they peeled each one out, etc., and what their final end was. You don't see that at all here. So they really didn't set up this meta analysis very well. And when I get down to the bottom, like you don't even know how many studies are being seen. You're looking for the big table, the big chart, etc. And all we have here is this is it. This is it. For a meta-analysis, they only have 24 citations. And out of that, they only include one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. This is what I'm talking about. I should use this example back in the prior unit, but I just found it. This is what I'm talking about when you talk about um, is a meta-analysis what worth to read? It doesn't have the content that you need. In my opinion, no. And by the way, huge red flag. They spelled articles wrong. 
how do you forget the A in articles? Typo, editor, no, that can't happen. So you look at these studies and look at the time differences. Basically, they have 2007, 2011, and one 2008. The, 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 the years are, are gapped and it, it looks really weird. So this is a red flag yellow fact to me. So I basically dumped this and did my own search looking for basically randomized trials to see if we can get something. So the first article I found, I'm going to scroll up. Sorry about that. The first article I found um, was effects of compression stockings on running economy kinematics and performance in runners. This is exactly what I was looking for. And you can read through the abstract. And basically what it is, is they set up a control group, a treatment group, and they did a whole bunch of different variables uh, to look at compression sockets. And the reason I'm bringing these articles up is because I want you to, to we're going to, I'm going to kind of show you some of the statistics. And these are statistics that you're going to have to come more familiar with when you look at these type of relational studies. So we can scroll through and see all the variables all the setup, here are your results. But for this particular section, what we're really concerned with, we really want to focus on, is the statistical analysis because that's what we're going to talk about, right? So you can see right there, here's the statistical analysis, um, the software they used, et cetera. And right there, you can see what they ran. They ran analysis of variance, repeated measures. So we're going to talk about what that means in a little bit in uh, the lecture. Um, you can see uh, what they set their significance level at, a 95% confidence interval uh, in 0.05. And as we go for results, there's their p-value. You can see um, all this kind of stuff is already included in here. But if you want to skip to the end, you just want to read the discussion, the main findings was that wearing compression stockings lowered percent heart rate max during time limit running at a competitive velocity, blah, blah, blah. So basically, this did help. The compression stockings did help. And so you read a little bit further and they said, our findings are different than those reported in the literature. The study of Ali reported similar times in a lower but non-significant. So the study by Ali was different than this current study. So what do you do? Well, you pick up the Ali study and there it is. So you went and I dug for this study and same concept, same idea. And again, if you scroll down through here, you can see their statistical setup is coming up, coming up. There's statistical analysis. There's your ANOVA, one-way, two-way repeated measures right there. There's their p-value right there. They even ran a correlation, which we'll talk about. And when you go through their results, all their stuff, you come down here. And I love when they do this. They gave you a practical application section. Um, this is the first study that compares it. And wearing GS had no effect on 10-meter time trial, so or 10-kilometer time trial. So two studies both using uh, randomized control variables and that type of relational study, they came up with different, um, different results. It's you as a consumer to then put this together and determine uh, which study, is, which study is, is going to factor more into your thought process. And there are maybe are there some research questions that there's just not enough data out there to make an informed decision yet. But this is just one example to kind of set the stage for what we're going to be going through uh, in this section, to set the stage that we're going to be looking at controls, interventions, and a whole bunch of new statistical, te statistical tests. Now, just as a, a quick heads up, I'm going to go over a handful of statistical analysis in this class, in this section. I'm not going to bog us down with it. You're going to find with some of these articles that they are running these unique, unusual type of tests that I have no idea about statisticians will. Um, so if you see a test that you're not familiar with, don't be afraid. Just look it up, find, a, you know, Google it, whatever, and read a little bit more about the test. There are a lot of new statistical tests out there that uh, a lot of researchers don't know about, and, and, and you might have to do a little background on it. But I'm going to expose you guys to sort of the basic ones and how to read through these type of uh, relational studies. So without that, we're going to go move forward and we're going to go on to the lecture. Okay, so let's talk about relational studies. And <clears throat> these notes are available on um, the Canvas site. So uh, if you want to uh, look at these notes and follow along with me, um, that's fine. So the first couple of slides that you're going to notice is there's a lot of different types of decision trees out there, uh, looking at your variables, your means, etc. And we're going to talk about some of the um, some of the terminology in a minute here, but understand you have your t-test, your z-test, regressions, chi-squared. So get used to, if you're reading an article and they say they ran a chi-squared, they ran a t-test, they're looking at a population mean, they're comparing means, etc. So 
once you sort of understand the type of test and what it's looking for, it's going to better inform you as you move forward. And, and the same thing with this type of uh, decision tree. We're looking at more of the uh, ANOVA. So is it a simple, uh, is it a one way, is it a multiple way, is it repeated measures, et cetera. So starting here, if your factors, one factor, two factor, in between, within subjects, and we're going to talk about all these terminologies mean, but Again, getting an idea of how you can uh, use a flowchart to help you uh, as you're going through your articles. And then something like this, which is um, a little confusing, but it makes sense. We start way over here on the left. Again, we take our dependent variable and we see how that is uh, negotiated through the tree. Um, one thing I want to mention now is this is a good example. There's a lot of statistical tests out there and we don't know them all. At least I don't know them all. Um, and that's fine. I mentioned it earlier. If you don't know a test, you're confused with a test, etc., look it up, find some more information about it, like a Spearman's, a Man Whitney, a Friedman's. They're out there. There are all these different types of tests. Don't get so confused if, if you come across a, a, a test that you're not familiar with. Just do a little research on it, and um, it should help, uh, help you understand as you're reading your results, etc. So when we talk about relationship and relational studies, um, you basically have your experimentals, and there's two types really, the randomized and the quasi-experimental. And the ran randomized, you're trying to measure the intervention effect. So you're going to have your intervention group, your control group, you can compare them, or you, you're looking for relationship between them. Um, usually it's a pre or a post design, or, or something happens. So randomized is the best way. If you remember way back when we talked about OR biases lecture, the best way to get rid of any of the bias was what? Randomize and blinding. So this randomized concept, the concept of using blind randomization is huge when you talk about relational studies. So keep that in mind. A quasi-experimental is the intervention comparison group, but they don't randomize. Um, you're trying to, you want to see if they match up well, but you're not randomizing them. So it's kind of quasi-experimental. It's not a true randomized control trial. Common statistical symbols, and if you're going to take another stats course, you're probably going to get more of this, but I just wanted to give you a heads up just in case you saw any of these and you kind of uh, knew what they were. And again, you're going to have these available on Canvas, so feel free to read them on your own. But as we're going through your articles, you're going to come up across these different symbols, an F-test, your null hypothesis, big N versus little n, a Pearson correlation, we'll talk about correlations coming down, your standard deviation, your variance, and then your Greek symbols, uh, your significance level, which is your type 1 error. So if you see alpha, you're thinking type 1 error. You see beta, you're thinking type 2 area, error, sorry, not area, error. Um, and type 1 error is your false positives. Type 2 area is your false negatives. Uh, your chi-squares we talked about in the uh, previous section. Population mean, degrees of freedom, uh, your Spearman's correlation, summation, your population, standard deviation, and variance, which you're going to notice that deviation and variance are basically the same things, that variance is, is a square of the deviation. Your Kendall's correlation and then your effect size. So get used to these symbol, symbols. If you want to print this out and keep it as a handy cheat sheet, um, that's fine too. So we're going to go through more of this. And when I was putting this together, I was trying to to put it in a way that would make sense to a consumer. So the left column here is when the article says this, I try to interpret that for you as a consumer, okay? And, and they're numbered to correspond to each other. So when the article says alpha equals 0.05 a priori, we are setting our confidence level at 95%. So 95% 0.05. So if it was 0 0.1, it would be 90%. We are willing to be wrong 5% of the time. So before the study starts, which is the a priori, we are willing to be wrong 5% of the time, and we're hoping to be 95% confidence we will not make an error with this study. So that's why they set the alpha level before they start testing. All right? Between subjects, difference between each of the subjects. Within subjects, difference with the same subject over time or trial. So this is if you have four people, between subjects is the difference between those four people. Within subjects is one person doing four different trials, all right, between versus within. You're going to see that when we talk about ANOVA. Your power, the probability that you will reject the null hypothesis when you should, meaning you're going to avoid your type 2 error. Go back a slide. Um, and typically power should be 0.8 or greater, so they should repay, 
report a 0.8 or greater power. But power is really a statistical test. The big one you want to see is effect size. Effect size is more practical because it gives you practical significance rather than just statistical significance. All right, so even if you have good power, it might not be practical, and however that is defined within the study. So effect size is what you really want to see. Your p-value, how likely the data is assuming a true null hypothesis, so that's why they set their p-value. And let's say after you do all your results, the p-value is 0.04. You would obtain the difference between the groups in 4% of the studies due to random sampling error. All right? And what that means is that 4% um, uh, you're, you're, of studies, you're going to get an error. It's going to be due to random sampling, not because of a true difference between the groups. So when you see this stuff starting off, the language that you're going to see in the articles, this should set you up for Validity. We talked about it earlier, but here's a review. Validity. The instrument was valid. It means the instrument measured what it was supposed to measure. If it had content validity, the instrument measured all the facets of the concept, like an IQ test. The IQ test should be me measuring all the things that needed that is needed for IQ. If it has construct validity, that means all the test items conformed to the same construct. All right. So if you have 20 items and they're all supposed to get at how physically fit you are. That's construct validity, all right? And criterion validity is the instrument corresponds to another measure. Uh, the classic example is skin fold versus hydrostatic weighing, all right? Those are both two different ways of measuring body fat. So criterion validity means that they measure up very well together. Reliability. If the instrument was reliable, it means it had consistent results. Intertester. Two or more raters doing the same measure. The E for inter is for external people. Intra tester, one rater multiple times. The A in intra is for autobiography. It's the same person doing it over and over. A little mnemonic device, if you will. Pearson interclass correlation. It's the relationship between the two measures. A correlation is a relationship or an association between the two measures, okay? And then the interclass correlation, you'll see the ICC reported a lot. That is the degree of agreement among two or more ratings. All right, so if you have a whole bunch of rating scales, they're going to run an ICC or interclass correlations to see how well they agree. Okay, so between validity and reliability, you have all these different subsections. I'm not going to go into great detail on it, but I just want to give you um, a little primer. So when you're reading the articles and they throw out intro test for reliability and they ran an ICC, you have an idea of what they were talking about. All right. When the article says mean, median, and mode, mean is the average, median is the midpoint, mode is the most frequent number. These are all considered the uh, uh, statistics essential tendency, which they usually report, or at least they should be reporting. Statistics of variability. When they say interquartile range, the IQR, this is the dispersion of your quartiles. And this gets into, you probably all saw this when you applied to grad school. Let's say you scored in the 65th percentile. What that means, if 100 per people took the test, so let's say your GRE, you scored in the 65th percentile on your G, GRE. Um, if 100 people took the GRE, you scored better than 65 of them and you scored worse than 35 of them. All right, that's what the percentiles mean. And there's a first quartile, a second quartile, third, and fourth. All right, so if you're talking about percentiles, it's just where you would fall if 100 people, just for the ease of 100%, where you would fall in that. Your range is the highest to lowest. Standard deviation is how far an individual scores vary from standard unit lengths. And this is where you get that nice normalized curve if you've ever taken any sort of introductory stat course. You assume the data is normal, then 95% of all the scores will fall within 1.96 standard deviations of the mean. So if you have a 95% confidence interval, that means that the data is going to fall 1.96 standard deviations off the mean. And your variance is just the standard deviation squared. All right, so basic variability, basic reliability, validity moving forward. Now we're getting into our inferential statistics. Now the inferential statistics basically means you're comparing sample data to population data. And 
this is where it, it, it gets a little bit weird, but you're never really ever going to test an entire population. What you do is you take a sample and you hope the sample is representative of the larger population and then you make your generalizability. So instead of measuring every single person who ever tore their ACL, you take a sample of people who have torn their ACL, you hope you can match the data and then you make a generalized comment. All right. Parametric statistics is uh, data is either interval or ratio. The sample relates to the population and the population has normality and this is what I just talked about. You assume normality, which means that means the sample can relate to it, which means you can make generalizability, which means you don't need to test the whole population. And non-parametric statistics, which I don't deal with much at all, uh, the data is nominal or ordinal, and there are no assumptions of normality. Now, if you need a quick review, go back to our units where we talked about the different types of variables in review, interval, ratio, nominal, and ordinal. Understand what those different types of variables means. And including that discrete, continuous, etc. So make sure you understand the type of variables that they're talking about. So let's talk about statistical tests. All right? And this is when they're testing the difference of means. When the article says a paired t-test, that means the difference between two related variables. The variables are related, therefore they're paired, and they ran a t-test on them. If it's an independent t-test, they're still looking for a difference between two variables, but the variables are independent and or unrelated. All right? An ANOVA, which is an analysis of variance, that's the difference between two or more group means. Technically, though, it's really the difference between three or more. What you're going to find, if it's only two groups or two variables, you're going to run your t-test. If it's three or more, you start to run ANOVAs, general rule of thumb. You could, in theory, run a ton of t-tests, but that's why you use the ANOVA, because you have more groups. If you have more groups, you're going to run an ANOVA. A one-way ANOVA, one factor being analyzed, a two-way ANOVA, two factors being analyzed. So if you go back to that compression stockings article, they ran a one-way ANOVA where they only analyzed one factor, and they ran a two-way ANOVA, meaning they looked at two factors. But because they ran an ANOVA, you knew that they're looking at more than one group, or more than three groups, I should say. Does that make sense? So they looked at multiple groups, but only one or two factors. All right, so start putting that back into the context of the uh, compression article. When the article says correlation, that's the association between variables. Understand, correlation does not mean causation. They are not the same thing. Just something, just because something is correlated does not mean it caused it. A Pearson correlation is association between continuous variables, Spearman uses ordinal, and a chi-square uses categorical. Again, if you are confused on the variables, then the correlation test won't make any sense. So go back through and um, review your different types of variables uh, that they're using. All right? All right, sorry about that. I can only uh, record so long in each YouTube video before it cuts me off. So we left off on, uh, left off on this correlational slide. And when you're talking about correlations, again, you're not talking about causation. You're talking about the association between uh, two, two variables and, and your different types of variables. And what you look for is they usually run some sort of scatter plot um, so if you see it's the scatter plot and what each of these dots is, it's a, um, your, your the variables are on either axis and where they intersect, that's a, a study, that's, a, that's an individual, that's a subject. So a positive correlation moving in this direction, a negative correlation in this direction, and no correlation where you can't really find a line. Okay, you can just kind of draw a line through these data points. You don't really have that, okay. Maybe you can consider it slightly positive, but absolutely not. There's no significance. There's no statistical significance, and certainly nothing that you would report. So when you talk about correlations, you're going to see that. And just like power and effect size and everything else, when you look at correlations, you want the you want it to be as high, as close to one as possible. So anywhere between that 0.7 or higher is considered a strong correlation or a good correlation. And some textbooks will vary about or vary on those values. Um, some want, you know, eight 0.85 or higher, some will go down as, as 0.6, 
it, again, it, it sort of is you need to make a decision as a clinician, as a consumer on where your cutoff is going to be and what you think is uh, applicable for your correlations. Now, similar to correlations are your regressions. And what a regression is, it's the change in one variable predicting the change in another variable. So a simple regression is changing the predictor variable, changes the level of the outcome variable. With a multiple regression, change in the combination to a more change in the outcome variable. And um, you can theoretically, just like a t-test in an ANOVA, you can run, if you have a lot of factors, you can keep running all of these t-tests, like hundreds and hundreds of t-tests, or you can put them all together and run the ANOVA. Same idea here. You can run tons of simple regressions looking at all the factors, or you can put them all together and run a multiple regression. And that's the beauty of these statistical tests and the power of these statistical tests is that you can put all this data in there and run these things. And that's why SPSS is so great because you just have to plug and chug and SPSS spits out all this nice information for you. So if you're taking any more statistical courses, uh, you're going to get used to putting in all that kind of data. And a regression with a regression line looks very similar to scatter plot, uh, but it's the same idea because one variable is now predicting the other variable. All right, so now that we have a basic idea of this, let's see if we can apply some of this vocabulary, nomenclature, et cetera, into a relational study and see what we can come up with. All right, so I'm back to my compression stockings article, and I'm back at the statistical analysis section of it. And let's see if we can kind of break this down and understand why they're using the statistical analysis that they're using. So I'm right here in statistical analysis. Data collected for all measured variables were compared using one-way or two-way repeated measures, ANOVA. All right, so immediately I know one-way ANOVA, I'm looking at differences between two or more groups. Okay, actually three or more groups like I mentioned before. So we got to figure out we have three or more groups being used. And a one-way means we're only looking at one factor, and a two-way means we're looking at two factors. All right. So when we get to the one-way ANOVA, we know we now know what we're looking for, okay? And you see they ran some of these are the specialty tests. I have no idea what they are. That's okay. I'm going to go back to where we feel comfortable. When differences were uh, identified, paired t-test. Well, we already know what a paired t-test is. That is looking for differences between two related variables. So we should already have a really good idea of what we're looking for. There's effect sizes. So we're looking for the practical um, application of this data. And you can see they defined it for us. So they said 2 is small. 0.5 is medium, and there's 0.8. I said 0.7, they want a 0.8, but at least they defined it for you so you know what they are considering a strong or a high effect size. And there is our Pearson correlation. Oh, excuse me. So Pearson correlation listed right here. And as you know, that means we're looking for continuous variables. So the relationship or the association between two um, continuous variables, and they set their P a priori, meaning before they did their study, at 0.05. Again, that means they're 95% confident that they're not going to uh, have an error, and they're willing to be have an error 5% of the time. All right, so let's look through the statistics and the results and actually see what they found. So no differences between interventions for the 10-kilometer performance time. All right, and here are their multiple groups. So you want to know why they run an ANOVA? Because they have a control group, a low group, a median group, and a high group. All right, so those are your groups that you have to run in ANOVA. You could run, again, a whole bunch of t-tests, but again, way too time-consuming, not needed to be done. Their P was 0.99. Well, they already established it at 0.05, so obviously it should be less than 0 0.05. 0 0.99 is higher than 0 0.05, therefore no statistical significance. And their Cohen's D, which is their effect size, it's less than 0 0.1. Well, they already defined their effect size is 0.2 is considered small. So this is less than small. So I guess very small. There are two AA NOVA. So again, multiple groups, which you already know about, the control, medium, um, high, and low. Those are your, your, your groups. And a two-way means we're looking at two factors. So let's go up here. They said um, the two AA NOVA reveal no main effects on treatment or time. So there's your two factors, treatment, Time are our two factors, and we already know here are our three groups. So that's why they ran a two-way ANOVA. All right? And again, if we come down here and we look at the data, you can see all the reported p-values right there and their effect sizes. 
So just using this as a quick example, you should at least be getting a little bit more familiar with why they ran an ANOVA or what it means to run an ANOVA and all that kind of stuff. And if we want to, we can scroll all the way back up. Um, and most studies won't do their data or won't present their data in this way. Um, this is a little bit unconventional, but at least they gave you sort of a, a guide to what they did here. But there are our groups, and I guess the lines are the individual scores, so uh, you, you kind of get used to that. But I do want to spend, spend a quick second here. I'm going to talk over some other tests, but I wanted to use this as a quick example to see how the terminology you just went over is being used, being applied, and hopefully you can now um, have a better idea of what the heck they're looking for when you read these type of research articles. All right, Bring, bringing this all sort of uh, uh, back together, um, like I mentioned earlier, I mentioned multiple times, there are tons of statistical analysis you can use. And luckily, if you're to power the internet, you can easily search for some of, these, some of these stuff. So if you're confused about why they use a certain statistical analysis, or if you are doing an article and you want to know which statistical analysis you uh, should be using, the first thing is always make sure you have some sort of statistician on retainers, so always go to them because they're going to be your experts. But a simple website like this through the Institute for Digital Research and Education from uh, UCLA will show you, you again, got to know your different types of variables. So um, your independent variable versus your dependent variable, understanding those type of uh, questions will really help you finding out what type of test you want to use. So here's your one sample t test, your chi square, your one way ANOVA, chi square, there's your pt t paired t test repeated measures ANOVA, et cetera. So you can look at all these different types of statistical tests and get more comfortable with them. But again, it kind of comes back to understanding your different types of variables and what exactly you're looking for. Oh, and the last little bit we're going to talk about is how do you assess these, these uh, randomized control trials. So you have all these great articles. How do you assess them? And we've been over these instruments before. And I had you last section look up these instruments and apply them. I'm not going to have you do that for this one because I think by now you have a pretty good idea of what goes into a good research article, what they should be presenting, what they should be um, uh, giving you as the reader, as a consumer. But this is a really good website also. It's called Consort. And you can see right here, it stands for Consolidated Standards of Reporting Trials. Um, this is a medical website more than anything. So you're going to see a lot of the articles that they'll use here have a medical basis. But the reason I like it is because it does talk a lot about what should go into a randomized trial. And the other thing I really like about this website is they basically are helping you understand how to apply it. And here's what I'm talking about. So if you go to consort um, hyphen statement dot org. What we can do is we can go to the extensions, uh, sorry, the download tab here. Oh, where did it go? Ah, here it is, Consort 210. Go to the checklist. Okay, so under Consort 210, go to the checklist. And here, just like we have done before with all the other checklists we've I've uh, talked about, is they actually go through here and they break it down. So this is 1A. It's a 25-item checklist. So 1A is uh, your title, and it tells you what should go in in the title. And an example, it gives you an example with a real citation, so you know what it should look like. All right, so then we go to 1B, which is your abstract. Well, here's what the abstract should be a clear, transparent, sufficiently detailed abstract, blah, blah, blah. And it talks about all the descriptions that should go into it and um, examples, etc. You go to your introduction section, background, objectives, methods, design, participants, study settings, interventions, outcomes, etc. And so this is a nice way for you to look through your article and see if it matches um, the checklist that Consort comes up with. And if you want to do it this way, you can also do it this way. It gives you uh, different types of uh, styles. We're going to stay here with the Consort. Um, I mean, if you just click on blinding, uh, it, it talks about how you blind and what should be done and how it should be documented, etc. So again, there's uh, 25 items when you look at it. And much like all the other checklists that I've kind of walked you through, um, it's not designed to be a pure assessment tool, but it's a really good guideline tool if you are writing a randomized control trial, you're writing these type of papers. It's a good guide for what you should be including uh, in, in it. If you're just reading, 
it's a good guide for you to understand did they include all the stuff they need to include. So I'm not going to have you complete a consort for this paper coming up, uh, but I do want you to at least kind of play around with it um, and just see all the wonderful things that are here. Uh, and the other cool thing is they actually give you real life examples. So if you go to a sample study, here's the paper and don't show again. So it'll tell you right there, it labels it, that's your title. And you can see they actually put it for you. Um, there's your abstract. So they color coded it and they, they let you see where they put all this kind of stuff um, in the sample study. So I thought that was a really cool tool. And again, it, it kind of helps you look for what a good uh, randomized control trial should look like. So those are um, relational studies. Uh, by now, you should have a really good idea of what goes into them, what they should be about, and hopefully you have a good idea how to read them and make the most out of them. So um, as you go through this uh, next assignment, any questions, comments, concerns, etc., please let me know, uh, and I will talk to you soon.